Physics Notes, Unit 26, Part B, The Physics of the Eye and Optical Instruments. So once again, the eye is incredible in what it can do. It's a miracle that it works, and there are issues sometimes, but for most of us that works, and you know, we're working on helping those who need correction. I mean, we all, almost, almost all of us need correction with eyeglasses, but there's other issues too that um, medical technology, and hopefully you're one of those people in the future, if you work on these issues, you can help people see better who have difficulty. We have this thing called an astigmatism. That's an improper focus due to imperfections in the shape of the cornea, the lens, or the retina. So the focusing, it's got, I mean, blurred vision. You get blurred vision. Anytime you have a problem, it's basically blurred vision or lack of vision at all. But this pattern over here is a test for astigmatism. And if you go to the eye doctor and uh, do this test, bottom line is they have you close one eye. And there's different variations on this particular wheel or whatever it is. You close one eye and look at this thing. And if you see a lack of sharpness in one of these spokes or a uh, difference in intensity or darkness, then you have an astigmatism problem. So you close both eyes, you look at this and see if anything is amiss. But um, that's just the test for astigmatism. In the last, oh, what's it been, 20 years, a laser vision correction, uh, laser in situ keratomyelitis. Uh, you, you probably can pronounce that better than I can. I'm not, I, I call it LASIK. We all call it LASIK. It's a very common procedure to correct um, vision, nearsightedness, farsightedness, or astigmatism. They can precisely use a laser. And what they do, and this is a pretty basic procedure here, they have an outline here, is they anesthetize the eye with drops. And it doesn't take very long. I, I've never, I haven't had it done. I went in one time to see, see if I wanted to have it done. It wasn't, I mean, it was expensive. But I went through the procedure. They said, okay, we can do this. We can fix your eyes. And then they put a pair of glasses. They put, they said, okay, when you're done with this, you won't need glasses. They said, okay, this is what you, your vision will be like when you're done. And they gave me a pair of glasses. It says, you won't need the glasses, but this is how your vision will be. And I looked around. It was a like, great vision. Okay. The problem was I, I was wearing those glasses and I took the piece of paper to, to like sign the contract or whatever. And I couldn't read the piece of paper. But bottom line is when, when they, they really can't fix two things at one time, I guess, okay, they could fix my uh, nearsightedness. In other words, I once they did the laser surgery, I could then see far, which is great, okay, but I then I would need I would have needed reading glasses after that, which is kind of the common old person problem. Well, I still so now I'm in the same boats certainly. Like I mean, it'd be kind of convenient not to have to wear the glasses, but but it, uh, I would still need, need glasses to read. So I said, no, oh, I'm not going to do this. They, they might have a procedure now, I don't know, where they can fix both. Or what they some people do is they have one eye fixed for reading far or for seeing far and one eye fixed for seeing near. I don't want to deal with that. So I'm just putting up with the glasses. And uh, I got rid of contacts a while ago. I didn't want to. I mean, I had contacts for years, and those are also kind of uh, a pain. But... Uh, they're, I mean, they're, they're, I guess they're better once you get used to them. I've worn them for years, but anyways, I'm off topic there. But bottom line, they, for LASIK, they cut a little flap on the cornea. They don't cut through the cornea. They cut like a little flap. They say, like here, that's a like cut a little flap and it's like an open door. Then they use the laser here, and it's much more precise than they're showing in that diagram. And they basically burn or just vaporize uh, different parts of the cornea. They, they, they can't add stuff to your eye. They take stuff away to reshape it. Because your cornea does a lot of the focusing, like I've said before, it does a lot of the focusing for your eye. That's like it's like two thirds of the focusing for your eye, not just the lens. The lens is kind of a sort of a tune-up. That's the adjustable focus. And then they put that flap back down, and it only takes a few days for that to heal. So it's pretty incredible what they do, and it's very safe. And I guess it works like 90, 95 percent of the time for people. And um, it's very popular. You don't need glasses, but you might need to have reading glasses after you're done. That was my case. But if I go back up here, yeah, I guess that's all, everything I just said. All right, going down here. Um, on to something slightly different. The visible light spectrum. We've talked about this before. I can't remember what unit. Unit. Um, I don't remember what unit. Unit. I'm trying to remember. Sorry. It's 
this is unit 26, like 24, 24 or 23. Anyways, the visible light spectrum, Roy G. Biv. Roy G. Biv. And a lot of times now we, we let go of indigo because it's really violet. But, but then it would just sound like Roy G. Biv. So we leave the I in there as a vowel so it sounds good. Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. The spectrum from low energy red to high energy violet. All the colors. Okay. Obviously, it's much more complicated than this because there's all different shades. There's millions of colors. If you did, you know, all different shades of red. When I was a kid, crayon, Crayola crayons came in a box of like 24. When my kids were kids, Crayolas came in like 132 colors. And there's all kinds of fancy names for all these colors. It's kind of cool. And then if you want to buy paint for your walls, there's all different colors of green. Um, and they all look different colors and different lighting. So that's a whole other issue here. So color is a, it's not subjective completely, but there is some subjectivity on a lot of variation within what kind of light source are you using and so forth. But white light is all the colors. Okay. Not all white is the same. If you go outside at night and look at headlights of cars, don't stand in front of the car. There are some headlights that are bluish, some are yellowish, some are whitish. There are different mixtures of the different intensities of the different colors mixed in. Black is the absence of light. So it's not really a color. White's not really a color. I mean, the colors are Roy G. Biff. Some other things here, opaque things, appear the color that they are because of the light they reflect. Green things look green because they reflect green. They absorb the other colors, at least to a large extent. They might not absorb them all perfectly, but they're very intensely reflecting green and mostly reflecting the other colors. Translucent objects, like stained glass or colored plastics and stuff like that, they appear the light that they they uh, pass okay, or transmit. So I have an example down here. Okay, red glass. So red glass lets red light go through it. It absorbs blue and green, turns it to heat. So when light gets absorbed, it turns into heat. So translucent. You know, white glass, or not white, white glass really would transmit most colors but absorb a lot of colors. Clear glass is what we normally have. It uh, transmits all the colors. Now you get into mixing of colors, which is interesting. It's too bad we're not in class because it's really fun to mix colored lights because you, you most classrooms have not done this. But mixing colored lights, it turns out that if you just have three basic colors, and we call these the primary colors of light, not paint. Okay, the three primary colors of light are red, green, and blue. Okay, in, I think in art class, your primary paints are going to be what? Red, uh, blue, and yellow. And technically, that's not the best combination. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But it turns out that, uh, and as I'll talk about in a few minutes as well, our cones, which are the color receptors in our eyeball, uh, we have red, green, and blue cones, we say. But red cones can uh, receive yellow light or even green light. They, they, can, they can detect other colors, but they're predominantly good in, in deciphering and receiving red light. They're most receptive to that. I'll show you a little graph here in a little bit. All right. Now, um, I have a color wheel here. It's interesting. Oh, also as a side note, we don't need all seven colors to make white. If we just take our basic primary colors, red, green, and blue, that'll look white to our eyes. But there's all kinds of other deeper issues here. You can read about it in the book. I'm not going to go deep into uh, other color perception problems, and we're not going to really go into too many uh, technical problems with mixing colored lights. But bottom line is, that if you look at this color wheel right here, blue and red light, you can look at this diagram to get the answers right away, but blue and red light, okay, blue and red light make magenta light. Magenta. That's it. That's where they overlap. Okay. Uh, blue and white make magenta. I'm sorry, blue and red make magenta. Uh, red and green, red and green make yellow. Okay, you can see that where they overlap over here. I'll circle it. Red and green overlap, they make yellow. Green and blue make cyan. So these are the official physics words. Let's just say C-Y-A-N. Make cyan. That's on the bottom here. Um, and then red and blue, I said magenta. But red, blue, red, and green make white. 
when you mix all three of those colors. So you don't need all seven to make white. It's interesting if you look at if you magnify any screen, like your computer screen, your iPhone screen, or you just your phone, any phone screen, uh, iPad screen, if you really could magnify it, you'll see what are called little pixels, little spots. And sometimes they're circles, sometimes they're rectangles. Here's some different configurations. But even at the screen you're looking at right now, if you're watching this on a computer, there is no white light coming off your screen. There is no orange light or purple light. Okay, All they have are these pixels. All right. If they want to make the screen look white, they just turn these up all bright. So all of these are magnified. They, you can see the red, green, and blue in these areas that I'm showing you in different configurations. You can certainly see the pixels. But if you make that far away, it all blends together. That will look white. All of those will look white to your eye. And that's what's happening in the screen right now over here to the right, like where I'm uh, bouncing my cursor up and down. If I were to magnify that, if I could magnify that for you on the screen right now, you would see little red, green, and blue pixels. And it might be in this, I don't know what configuration is in. It might be this configuration. But it's red, green, and blue dots. Okay? And if they want to make something look yellow, they have red and green dots on. They turn the blue dots off. If you turn the blue dots off, okay, the screen will look yellow. All right? If you turn the, the green dots off, it'll look magenta, like the mixtures I just said. And if you turn off the red dots, it'll look uh, cyan, that light blue color. Uh, but if you want something like orange, what you do is you have you, you uh, turn off the blue, you turn the green kind of half on, and then the red fully on. So different different intensities of the different colors can give you different shades. Uh, if you want to make something look pink, I forget what they need to make pink. Uh, it's a little bit of red and I don't know a little bit of a little bit of blue and no green. Uh, whatever it takes. You could look at the formula for for what it takes to make pink and all the hundreds of thousands of different of colors depending on how. You know, they have, they have different uh, intensities. You know, the red could have like 50 different intensities. You know, turn it on a little bit or a little bit more, a little bit more. It's like a, a variable brightness. So you could have almost infinite colors, basically, depending on how bright you make each of the colored pixels. It's quite interesting because, believe it or not, any computer screen only has three actual colored pixels. But you can make millions of colors. It's, it's quite incredible. And once again, your eye... The cones in your eye respond to these light waves going into your eyes. As a side note or similar uh, idea here, the primary colors of paint, like to mix paints, which you did in art class, you do in art class. Pigments, we call them pigments or ink. The best colors are not red, blue, and yellow. Okay, they're cyan, magenta, and uh, cyan, magenta, and yellow. I should have said that in art class it's red, blue, and yeah, red, blue, and yellow. It turns out that cyan is kind of a bluish color. It's a light blue. Magenta is kind of a dark red. Okay. But bottom line is these are the colors that are best for printing. And you can prove it easily. Okay. Yeah, so because in art class, if you, if you ask an artist, what are the primary colors of paint? And they can say it. It's fine. They will say red, blue, and yellow are the primary colors of paint. Technically, cyan, magenta, and yellow are better. And the way you prove that is by looking in a printer. If you ever buy ink for your printer, the cartridges, they'll be cyan, magenta, yellow, and black ink to make um, the different other mixtures of colors. So one of the ideas is this, is that um, when you mix paints, okay, the corresponding color gets darker and darker. When you mix lights, like up above when I mix the light colors, okay, like Red and blue are kind of darker colors. Magenta is a lighter color. And white is the lightest color of all. Brightest color. Okay. So the more and more light you mix, the more and more you go towards white. The more and more paints you mix, the more and more it goes towards dark or black. Because it absorbs light. When you absorb light, you get darkness. The bottom line, I'm trying to make the case that the best mixing colors are cyan, magenta, and yellow. Not red, blue, and green. Uh, red, blue, and yellow. Red, blue, and green are the best colors for light mixing. Like you see in those screens up there. All right. Uh, once again, the eye, the incredible eye. It's fascinating, and this is this doesn't even do its service. You have rods and cones. All right. So rods are what basically give you intensities. They're good for detecting um, peripheral peripheral vision, but not for color. Okay. 
They are, there's like 120 million of these things in your eye, in one eye. And the cones are for color. They're mostly in the middle, but they're also other parts, but they're mostly in the middle, okay? And these di these diagrams don't do the justice even, but light comes in to your eye, step number one here, and they're going to magnify this area right by the optic nerve, okay? I think that's the, fo the fovea is like the center back of the eye. It's the most visually acute area of the eye. It's got the best... Um, sharpest, clearest vision, okay? Uh, but here's kind of a blown up region of that fovea where then the optic nerve, and once again, this is not even doing it justice. All these, I'm not sure what they call those connections, okay? Sending these signals to your brain from all these millions, 100, 120, 130 million sensors, and they're showing that this is an animation. These are not what they actually look like. So it's an artist's rendition. And all these other types of cells, epithelial cells, um, and it there's there's blood vessels in here to keep this you know to keep um, uh, the eye healthy because you need to have blood. But it's really weird how the light actually has to go through a bunch of layers, and this shows you where then it's uh, being received by a rod, okay, or a rod is reacting to a a, way, uh, a ray of light in the back of this area here. And then it sends a signal via this, well, it's showing you a dashed line, to the brain. But this is happening millions of times a minute, a second. Maybe billions of times per second. All this information, all this light going into small openings, hitting rods and cones. Okay, And they're showing you here cones with different colors. Cones have a different uh, makeup. Let me show you a little diagram here. This, is, this diagram here is actually a picture uh, of rods and cones. I don't know if it's using an electron microscope or not. I think it is because it's very magnified, but it shows you how big cones are. Cones are much smaller than rods. Cones are much smaller than rods. And this is a, this is a, once again, a little diagram of what a rod might look like. And it doesn't do it justice. It's so much more complicated than any of this even. Okay. And then they're magnifying. This is an actual, I think this is an actual picture here for part B. That's one micrometer. Okay. One micrometer. It's one one hundredth of a meter. No. One one thousandth of a meter. No, no, let me say it again. That's millions, millions of thousands. It's one millionth of a meter. One millionth of a meter. Okay, it's part of the consist like the consistency of what this outer segment of the of the rod cell is. And there's a nucleus, and it's just incredible. Just just one rod out of the hundred and twenty million that are in your, in your eye. This is ten micrometers. Okay, so it'll be a hundred thousand one hundred thousandth of a meter. Okay, so that's ten millionths, 10 each micro, so it's 10 millionths of a meter. Uh, here's another rendition of these. I'm not going to be, you know, for those of you who are biologists and um, ophthalmologists, you'll need to know some of these things. you probably have to memorize these parts of the eye, possibly, and it's incredible. Once you dig down, it gets more and more intricate and incredible and amazing. I, I mean, I I could have somebody teach me about this. I don't know as much about this because I don't. This is beyond the physics right now. Well, there's obviously physics involved, but but uh, it's more a biological, biophysics, chemicals, chemical reactions. Uh, it's incredible. This is a, a graph of of uh, well absorption rates for different rods and cones. So it's showing you here like blue cones. Blue cones. There's a peak right here at 420 nanometers. If you go down down here. So blue cones can detect blue, cyan, green, but not much, and violet, but predominantly it detects blue light, which has a certain wavelength, and then you can figure out the frequency, like we did in unit unit um, 17, I think. Uh, the the red red cones are not much different than green cones. Red cones, though, are most intense in like yellow. A lot of light from the sun comes in yellow. There's a lot of yellow in our environment. But it also can, you know, the red cones detect red. Green cones are best in green. So there's not a whole lot of difference, though, in those two graphs. Rods are excited or respond to a wide range of frequencies or wavelengths, all the way from violet up to yellow. All right, not much red. Rods don't respond much to red, according to this graph, if that's true, which I tend to believe it's true. So it's interesting uh, what the different rods and cones respond to. 
but there's a lot more rods. They don't respond to color, or, or well, they respond to photon or energy coming in, but um, almost any color, but strong, most strongly in green. But they don't send color signals to your brain, just intensity signals. Then we have what are called lens defects, problems with, uh, more so we're talking about uh, lenses used in microscopes and telescopes, not so much the eye. It could be the eye, but lens defects, problems, problems with lenses. Light does not properly focus and fuzzy, F-U-Z-Z-Y, fuzzy images result. Blurry, should have said blurry, blurry images result. There's two main kinds of lens defects that have to be corrected for. And the way they correct for these things is by very expensive lenses, putting special coatings on the lenses, different ways of shaping, excuse me, shaping the lenses. But you have two kinds. You have chromatic aberration. Chromatic means color. And we kind of talked about this with dispersion back when we did prisms in uh, Unit 25 with prisms and raindrops. So light of different colors refract differently because blue bends more than red. So blue bends more than red. So once again, you blurred or fuzzy images. Blue bends more than red. So if you look at this diagram here on the left with that lens, so we have a lens here that's showing you chromatic aberration. All right, and it's showing you that the blue, uh, if you look carefully, and, I, uh, and what they should have here, I'll change the blue for a second. The blue is focusing like right here, putting a dot right there. The blue is focusing right there. What should be happening, and they have the red in the wrong spot, okay, because the blue should focus, it bends the most and has the shorter focal length, and red should have the longest focal length, and green should be in between the two. I don't know why they have green outside of red. So red should be the outside color, and green should be the one in between the two. So the diagram's a little bit messed up, because green should be kind of like, it's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. So blue should be bent the most, red should be bent the less, least. So just make a note of that, I guess, that Green should be the middle color there, not the outer color. At least that's what my eyes are seeing. This is an actual diagram over here of some kind of chromatic aberration because of some lens and some camera taking a picture of this horse on a weather vane or something. But you see some colors in there because the colors are, it's not focused, it's blurry because you have some chromatic aberration. You see some color separations there. Then you have what are called spherical aberrations. When light passing through different parts of the lens focus differently, giving blurry Im images again, light through the outer part of the lens has a shorter focal length. Shorter focal length. And you can see that here, okay, if I go the outer, if I go to this, this coming in, that ray, uh, let me do a little bit better than that. I'll do a little better. Well, you can see where it intersects right here, okay. It's going to go through, oh, that's not too bad. That's the focal point for that. If I take these two outer ones, all right, not too bad. They focus right there. Where the two inner rays, I'll change a different color. The two inner rays, I'm not doing, this is, this is not chromatic aberration right now, but the two inner rays focus right there. All right, this one here comes through and it has a farther out focal point. Not too bad. I shouldn't get cocky here. Okay. So they focus differently. You get, you get blurry images. You get blurry images. And that can be true for, Converging or con, uh, diverging lens. So this one doesn't show it so much over here. Uh, it should show you that the, they don't focus at the same point. Actually, this is a counterexample to spherical aberration. All of these look like they're coming from the same spot. So that's not really showing you any spherical aberration. This one's showing you spherical aberration. I'm not sure how I put that there. It's, it's, but I guess you can just say not showing spherical aberration. Okay. So no visible spherical aberration on this diagram. Okay, this one does. Okay, this is spherical aberration. S-P-H-E-R-I-C-A-L, spherical aberration. A-B-E. Okay, because there's two different focal points. Or you could have seven different focal points for the seven different colors. I don't need to show all seven different colors. I'm just showing you at least the two extremes have two different focal points. This one does not, there's no visible uh, spherical aberration. But once again, the bigger the lens is, the more of a problem this is um, because the outer rays don't focus the same as the inner rays. All right, so additional um, important uses for lenses and mirrors. Obviously, microscopes, they magnify small things. 
Now, there's different versions of microscopes, but the basic idea for a microscope, it has two lenses. We're not going to get into all the diagrams right now. It's showing you a diagram here, but it's, it, the diagrams can be very complicated. The math can be, well, you have to apply the lens law twice. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do compound lens computations. But you need to be familiar with this, that microscopes use two lenses. You have what's called an objective lens, which is the initial lens that's close to what the object you're looking at. So we have an actual object here. We have an actual object here. It's like a little, usually you're looking at something on a microscope slide. So you guys probably have used, it's going to be important for doctors or for um, pathologists and people like that to look at small things. You probably have to do that in your biology classes. And you want to be able to see them so it magnifies and make them bigger so you can see them. All right. So you have, first of all, you have an objective lens, which is really close to your object. It forms an image. So here's our first image, real image in this case. Then you have a second lens. It's called the eyepiece lens. So you have the um, objective lens, which is the first one by the object, and you have the eyepiece lens. And in this case, the eyepiece lens is such that the image, so the object for the first lens becomes the image for the, I mean the image for the first lens. So this is the image, the initial, it says initial image. Now it's the object for the eyepiece lens, and then the person, your eyeball, when you're looking into the microscope tube right here, all right, it's going to see something this big, final image that big. So it helps you see things that are small. So it's useful for doing research and fighting diseases and getting cures for things like COVID. Come on, people, solve COVID. And uh, finally here, telescopes. They typically are used to magnify distant objects. You have the same idea with binoculars and so forth, but uh, most telescopes are used for astronomical research. And there's two different types of telescopes. There are the refracting telescopes. Basically they have two lenses. They have an objective lens once again. They have a long, tube. they're long. Those, those are the typical kind that you would see that people would draw, like a long tube. And you have the objective lens, and the bigger the lens the more light it can gather. The problem with refracting telescopes is they can get very heavy. And there's a lot of distortions and defects in lenses, as we discussed before. And then you have your eyepiece lens. This is a simplified view of a basic, long, tubular, refracting telescope. Most telescopes now are reflecting telescopes. They have like a primary mirror. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. But we have the world's largest refracting telescope right up in Wisconsin, right across the border. It's called the Yerkes Observatory. It's, it's fascinating if you go up there. I don't, know if the, I don't know if they're still doing tours because they've decommissioned that telescope, I believe. They're not really using it anymore. Well, I guess they use it just for demonstrations, but I don't think they're doing any research on that. You'd have to, re uh, you'd have to check that out, but it's up by uh, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. It's, uh, it's a huge telescope, and they, they, it was built like in the late 1800s, and it was used for a long time, and I think the uh, University of Chicago controlled it, but I think they've given up control now of that um, telescope, because it takes money to, to keep it going. But anyways, most telescopes now are reflecting telescopes because they can basically make them bigger. The mirrors can be bigger. Here's basically a picture of this telescope. Let me see if I can get there. All right, so here's two different versions of a reflecting telescope. A lot of times the eyepiece lens, it's a lens. So here you have two mirrors and a lens, and you look at the side. And usually they're bigger around. This is kind of the model of a one that uh, you might use in your backyard. They could be good ones. They can be very expensive. But they have a primary mirror, basically in a parabolic shape. The, the, um, the ones in outer space, I believe, are all reflecting telescopes. The Hubble telescope and the Kepler telescope. They're very famous telescopes. There's other ones in outer space. And the reason why they put them in outer space is because the atmosphere tends to give you distortions in your images as well. So whether it's refracting or reflecting telescopes, uh, putting them in outer space is better because you get less interference from the atmosphere. But bottom line here, you can see, well, the aperture is how big around it is. It basically accommodates the mirror in the back or fits the mirror in the back. And then this secondary mirror, which should be small because you don't want it be, to be blocking a lot of light going to the primary mirror, and it reflects to the eyepiece, which then just kind of helps you focus the light. There's an alternate uh, version of this where you have, 
basically a hole in the back of the mirror here. So you have your primary mirror right here, and then it reflects to the uh, secondary mirror, and then to your eyepiece, which focuses. That's That can be a long tubular telescope as well. But once again, a lot of research and a lot of exciting science things are done with telescopes, figuring out what's going on out in the, the far beyond where other planets and other moons and other solar systems and nebula and so forth. And if you're an astronomer, it's, it's uh, quite exciting. So that's it for applications and of uh, well, vision and optical instruments that use mirrors and lenses. There's there's other things, but these are the these are the some of the most common objects that use mirrors and lenses. So that completes our unit on optics, geometric optics, and optical instruments. Uh, actually, we will talk a little bit more about in the next unit. Uh, the last unit for this particular term, it'll be on diffraction, the bending of light as it goes through small openings. So that is what will be next.